It's Tuesday. Let's go, boys. Good morning from yeah. all of the country, primarily the uh, well, like the mountain time zone, because that's where your boys are at. But primarily, we all survived Monday Night Football last night because for some reason the NFL keeps putting the Broncos on, and uh, it's good though because they like to get to bed early on Mondays, so that's good. It it, it puts your boy right to sleep. It's yeah, awesome. let Russ cook us up another nap. <laughs> oh, it's tough as a Denver resident, a Bronco fan, and a personally a huge fan of Russell Wilson. It's been tough to watch this year. Ryan, turn that mic up just a little bit. So the thing to me about the Monday Night Football schedule, what the NFL is trying to do, and all the reasons why it's failing, is you're only giving me the same crap teams all the time. You're giving me the Broncos, you're giving me the Bears, and now the Green Bay Packers are crap too. So it's it's as hard to watch as any professional sport in the world right now, especially when baseball is as good as it's been in the last 20 years right now currently, and no one's giving it the love it deserves. Hold on. Don't just throw shade at my Packers like that. The only year that Aaron Rodgers ever won a Super Bowl, they snuck into the playoffs the last week. They were the wild card. They rode it all the way to the Super Bowl. That's the game plan for this year. Everything's going according to plan. No, Van, I think his point is that baseball playoffs are amazing this year. This is, is the baseball that we pay to see. Uh, hold on. This baseball is- playoffs are better every year. I mean, there's that. This is the baseball year with walk-offs. This is the baseball year with high-run games. This is the baseball year with extra innings. This is the baseball year where pitchers that wear 60 on their jersey are thrown in 100 miles per hour. And I'm saying, I, I, I'm licking my finger. I'm like, I can't wait to have more of this baseball all the time. Yes. I, is, I can't get enough on it. I, I mean, just look on. at the Astros series, for example. Obviously, I'm an Astros homer. Look at all the swag everywhere. You're something. But two Yordong walk-off shots and then an 18-inning game where no one could get a hit. Like It's the dichotomy. It's beautiful. Walk-offs everywhere. Rookies are performing. Veterans are coming out of nowhere that you forgot about. It's beautiful baseball. And it's the year of the underdog. It's the year that we expanded the playoffs, that we were not – we as fans – as, as players, we weren't sure how we were going to feel about having all these extra teams in the playoffs, adding extra wild cards. I know there was a lot of people that were worried that you're gonna, now you're just letting half the league into the playoffs. But look what's happening. You have a five seed and a six seed going to the, the championship series, and you might have another one in the American League. Well, and we had talked about that earlier uh, on the other program that Van and I do, where you don't have the one sixty three game anymore. You don't. You have so many teams in contention up to the end, and it comes down to weird percents. But Major League Baseball has gotten it right, and that to me is the thing that has made the postseason so entertaining. Also, TBS is doing it better than anyone right now, and I think they had a real opportunity because with Fox losing Buck and kind of doing some of those things on how the game's being presented, uh, just absolute top tier. I'm Fred Slow over on this side is Van Nunley, who's the co-host of my program, Two Men On, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, every day. And below us, down at the bottom, Ryan LaVarnway, Major League Baseball player, Olympian, World Baseball everything, uh, Yale graduate, and uh, uh, a brand-new father. There we go. Yeah. My little girl's upstairs sleeping. Hopefully she stays quiet for this whole thing. Well, make sure the headphones are on tight. The uh, this is episode zero of going Oppo. We are doing we are doing what we're going to do a lot, but we're doing it for the very first time, and we're excited about that. Um, this one is recorded. You're not going to be able to fan interact, but moving forward, that will be the format. But we wanted to make sure we had everything handled technical wise, because similar to a lot of the guys are doing it. Not only are we the talent on board, but we're the technical behind it, and we're not nearly as good at the technical part as we are the talent part. So it, it was figuring it out and kind of working out the loops, but looks the part, feels good. Uh, Ryan, this is not your first Fourier into radio, but this is kind of like the first podcast you've been a part of where it's your name on it. It's your brand. You're creating it in a way to give to not just your fans and friends, but your family and people that care about you. Uh, Talk a little bit why it's important. Talk a little bit about why you're excited to be part of the product. I'm, I'm excited to share my love for baseball with the world. This is something that I wrote an article that got published in the Detroit, the Detroit Free Press earlier this year about why am I still playing after 15 years? Like I'm not a Hall of Famer in the big leagues. I'm not making $100 million. But the fact is I just love playing baseball. I love talking about baseball. I love sharing baseball with friends, family, strangers. Um, and I, I met you guys last year at the Super Bowl doing media. 
and we had so much fun for about 20 minutes for a segment and i'm just excited to spend some more time with you guys Usually I don't get in year long relationships after 20 minutes of fun, but I'm glad you jumped in and made that commitment. Unacceptable. Uh, Van and I host two men on, which is an Albuquerque based sports talk show. You can find that uh, at talk ABQ everywhere you go. Uh, Obviously Ryan joins us regularly on that program as well. Uh, But it's a really good terrestrial outreach, which has given us a lot of opportunity, including the Super Bowl, which is where we met Ryan. And then uh, Ryan, who you can see behind, he has played for uh, 45 of the 30 MLB teams and has a collection of all the hats. Yeah, these are all my my big league one ear flap batting helmets, which people love to try on. The first time I ever wore one was in the big leagues. I made my major league debut for the Boston Red Sox over here. Right there. Close enough. Um. And we were in Kansas City, and I remember I put the big league ear flap or the one ear flap helmet on, and I was just amazed that I could just out of my right side where there was no ear flap, I could hear everything, my perifs could see everything, and then all of a sudden it was an zero and two count before I realized I was still playing baseball. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of people love to try these on when they come over to the house. I got my I got my World Series ring and my three AAA championship rings up here hanging out. So yeah, uh, maybe. Excited to be able to display some of this stuff. Van, have you been to Kaufman? No, I have not. All right. So it's a it's in my opinion, one of the prettiest baseball stadiums in in the entirety of the world, not just this country. But Ryan, walking out in Kaufman for the first time, right? Because you're how old? How old are you at that time? I had just turned 24. So you're an idiot. So you're walking out to Kaufman as a 24-year-old uh, Yale everything, and you look up and you see you see the crown in the outfield, and and maybe you had Arthur Bryant's the night before because you're in Kansas City. Like, what is that? Is that moments to you? Is that a stretch of history that feels like an hour even still today? Like, like kind of relive that for us. Van and I don't know the story. So the story goes, um, I was – killing it in triple a i was i had hit 30 home runs by august there you go and my teammates were all like dude what do you got to do to get called up and (laughs) this was this was 15 years ago at this point or 12 years ago at this point whenever it was where rookies and prospects were not the high value ticket items that they are today they were still like all of the organizations really valued veteran leadership experience knowing what you're going to get and we had jason veritek pretty good all world, everything. My hero, one yeah. of my favorite players growing up, and David Ortiz as the DH. So in my head, I had 30 home runs, but it didn't matter because where am I going to go? But we're watching. I was in Pawtucket. We're watching the major league game on the TV, and they're playing a getaway day in Boston while we're in the clubhouse between the, our batting practice and the game. I'm scheduled to catch that day, and David Ortiz gets pulled from the game with an Achilles something or other. And as I'm thinking to myself, oh, that might be cool. There's a tap on the shoulder. Hey, (laughs) hey, Skip wants to see you. And he says, hey, you're going to fly to Kansas City tomorrow to meet the team. David Ortiz and Kevin Euclid are both going to see the doctor. If either one of them is banged up, then you're in the starting lineup. And if they're both good to go, you're just going to get on a plane and come right back here. So don't tell anyone because it's not official. And uh, I flew on a plane. I watched... On my, on my laptop that weighed 10 pounds, I watched the DVD version of For Love of the Game. I'm, this is how long ago this was. Best movie of all time. Hands oh, down God. Movie. Don't put quarters into Fred. Best, Don't start best this already. Best film I've ever seen. I cried yeah. like a baby on this plane on the way to my maybe Major League debut. I get off the plane. They say, you're in the starting lineup. Come straight to the stadium. And I didn't really have time to think about it. You know, yeah. I, re- I remember that plane flight, that conversation. Um and most of my family didn't have time to get there because it was a last minute. Yeah, you're in. What, did you look at the the battery? Did you know who? Did you know who you're going to hit off of? Was it like an all star? Was it a rookie? Like, were you ready to go up there and swing? No, I have. I still ha- don't remember. We'd have to look it up on Baseball Reference. I know I didn't <laughs> get a hit the first day, and then all my family got in town for the second day, and I got my first hit the second day. The th- in, it turns out it was Zach Grinky the whole time. Like, and you're like, you can't remember. You're like, you're like, okay, no, that would make sense. That That's an 0 for 3 day. That's that's how that, that would explain why it was 0 and 2 before I realized I was playing baseball. Sure. <laughs> what year was it again? Give it to me. 2011, August okay. 18th, I think. So, so that's four years before Kansas City was really the hotness that Kansas City was. And 2011 uh, was a good year for where I'm from, St. Louis, Missouri. We ended up 
uh, enjoying that year immensely. But the thing about uh, coming up in Kansas City is Kansas City fans really recognize and love and appreciate the game. And whenever they see you come up wearing the 60 jersey and, and, and you're catching them the first day you're doing that thing, is the ovation there for the fan base? Do they recognize you as this is a day one or guy and they give you like that appreciation and love? Or did that not come until you went back to Boston? Yeah, not as the visiting player. They they weren't pumped. They didn't they didn't really care. Plus, like you said, it was four or five years before they were any good. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember there being a, a massive crowd for this game. No, there's often there's not that is a i've been a lot to kaufman stadium that's a five dollar ticket van to get in and then you're sitting in a 150 dollar seat down by the that's that's a pretty good little move <laughs> what i remember you about 12 stadium, other people <laughs> what i remember about the stadium is the the waterfalls are along the outfield are beautiful yeah and it took me about six innings to realize that the scoreboard and the hedges that are the batter's eye make a giant person shoulders and head yes it's yeah it's it like took me way too long to get there <laughs> Okay, well, to be fair, to be fair, it took me 40 years to realize that because I never seen it. And I've watched a lot of baseball. (laughs) (laughs) There's been a lot of baseball this past postseason as it's uh, Major League Baseball postseason started late. It's going to go at least till November the 1st. It's probably going to go past that because it's not going to end in four games. Um, But it has been just really condensed and it's been really tight. Give me your impression, boys, of the Major League Baseball playoff thus far. Give me your impression of the wild card and the DSs and where we currently sit. Uh, And today, in reference to the listener and the viewer, today the Yankees game against the Cleveland Guardians has been rescheduled till 4 o'clock Eastern today. So we're on before the reschedule, but we're not we're not at that point yet. So kind of give me your guys' overall impression of, of how it's gone thus far and, and your energy that surrounds it. So I think the MLB, it's a giant conspiracy to get a World Series for my Astros yeah, to make up for falling on the sword for league-wide cheating. This is the year of redemption for the Astros. And they softballed a bunch of candy corn losers in their way so it could be smooth sailing all the way to the title. First impression. Oh, boy. <laughs> Coming in hot, baby. Ooh, where do we even go from there? I, I mean, <laughs> Justin Verlander has been incredible at 150 years old in baseball years. Incredible. How, how can you compete with that? Bregman's been incredible. Your Van Alvarez has yeah, been incredible. Baby. Um, I'm not counting out my, the, my guardians. I was with those boys last year. I was with Cleveland when, when we still call them the Indians. Uh, I still message with half of that team once a week. I'm not counting them out. You got SpongeBob coming out clutch as a rookie. You got Josh Naylor emotionally leading the team. The pitching staff is unreal. Emmanuel class a throwing 103 mile per hour cutters as talented as the Yankees are. If it comes down to one game, it's anybody's ball game. I'm I'm going with the Guardians because they're my boys. Like yeah, I I agree, man. Because they're they're that scrappy. Put the bat on the ball. The Yankees bullpen wasn't what it was early in the year, and they just seem like you hear it every year. That team of destiny. I'm really appreciative of how Van just skips over the wild card like it doesn't count because the Astros weren't there. Like that to me <laughs> is the equivalency of all Astro fan. Like yeah. baseball does not matter until my team has a chance to cheat at it. And the Mariners team, who did so very well in the wild card, beating up on Toronto, who to me is the team of the next, I've been saying this for 10 years though, they're the team of the next 10 years, and they're going to do something really impressive with this young core. But Seattle gets to a point where that was the World Series. Like winning the wild card for Seattle was them getting through because losing game one to the Astros for the Mariners was just more Mariners. Like, they weren't ready for – they weren't accustomed to a winning opportunity. If they had got game one against Houston, I bet you they had a better shot in game two and game three. But because Houston came back with that walk-off by Jordan Alvarez, and why do you bring in starting pitcher Robbie Ray to waste one to a guy who only hits bombs? Like, to me, it was the most undermanaged and not necessarily best approach to winning, and it did them throughout the whole series. They weren't going to come back from that after that. Well, I I was talking to a Mariners fan right after that happened, and I was like, okay, if the Astros are capable of cheating in a manner that they did, why not collusion? Why not get one of their old catchers, put him as manager of the Mariners so he could make a series of bad decisions to lead the Astros to the championship? 
if not cheating, then why not collusion? I'm into this. This is you're reminding me of my 10th grade math teacher who said <laughs> it's not cheating unless you get caught and you're not trying unless you're cheating. Hey, spoken like a true Patriots fan. Yeah. It's, well, oh, we talk about you, you sound like you sound like a Patriots fan because when Bill Belichick would do something that was like slightly off color, slightly outside the boundaries, you called him a genius. And the Super Bowl, aka the Tom Brady Invitational, was really the only playoff football that you cared about. Sure. Well, I, yeah, I mean, it's so, not wrong. Oh, take it, man. I mean, sure. Since the cheating scandal, like, like you mentioned, Fred, like, of course, my focus is only on the Astros getting another championship to redeem themselves for losing to the hot team in the playoffs every year and redeeming that championship and showing that they're they're not a fluke. This is a great franchise and they're going to be good for a long time. As a fan, and I'm hopefully speaking for a large part of the fan base, that we got to have one this year or next year or sometime to legitimize what we've been doing on the field. And, you know, as somebody on a microphone, I have to ride the fine line in between being an objective member of the press and being an absolute Astros fanboy. I mean, there's, I have a picture of me in a tequila sunrise Astros onesie when I'm a newborn baby. Like, that's how far it stretches hey. back. I've been ride or die this whole time. Send so, that you know, to me. I'm going to put it Fred up on the podcast. Like, me, me and Fred have a radio show and podcast here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I have to be an air quotes objective member of the press, but not when it comes to the Astros. It's the only time it's surrendered. Correct. And Ryan, for you, who obviously, like, you were in the minors all year long, you pay close attention to baseball throughout that course of that year, and at the beginning of the year, you and I sat down at the at the Super Bowl, and we were like, hey, who are you feeling? Like, who do you think at the end? And I even remember you at the, or at the Super Bowl saying, oh, Houston, New York. Do we do all of this just to get to the point to where it's going to end up being Houston and New York, or does Cleveland have a shot to dethrone that? Does Cleveland have a shot to show up and do that? Uh, hashtag Cinderella story and put like Houston in the spot that they should be in, which is the losers column and give the nation someone to actually cheer for. I think that, I think the guardians are a team that, that people could get behind people outside of Houston. Mm -hmm. And as far as managers, who doesn't love Terry Francona? This guy, this guy is, is baseball royalty. He is beloved by his players. He's beloved by his fan bases. That being said, Van, I will give you the Dusty Baker who fell on the sword, who had to do all those press conferences after the mm -hmm. cheating scandal when he wasn't even there even for the there. cheating scandal. Yeah. He might deserve a little something too. This you is mean, a uh, hold on, put some respect on that man's name, no. Dusty Baker, the inventor of the high five. What a real stat. You got to preface that. The <laughs> Dusty Baker, who was in Chicago for what seemed like a million years, he has done less with more talent than I think I've seen managers anywhere. This isn't just the Houston Astros redemption story. This is the Dusty Baker redemption story because he needs to show that he knows how to manage guys that can win. Because when he was doing it for so very long elsewhere, Cincinnati is a really good example. Joey Votto to me is maybe the best first baseman I've ever seen in person that's not Albert Pujols. And I can't believe that Joey Votto hasn't had more success. And I think a lot of that has to do with how things are managed around him. And for Dusty Baker to blow this one, for Dusty Baker to not be able to put his team over the New York Yankees or the Cleveland Guardians when the time comes, that to me, I would say it's not the Astros. It's the same old Dusty Baker. Ooh. I mean, you know how hungry that guy is. Like He seems cool. He seems chill. He's the voice of reason. But in his heart of hearts, in the back of his mind, 24-7, he's like, I got to get one of these. How many more one. chances do I have? For for Dusty Baker's sake, I would like to see Dusty Baker win a win a World Series, but I don't want to see it in Houston. <laughs> <laughs> you and everyone else, literally yeah, every it, it sucks for Astros Nation because there's so many fun, likable people yeah. on the Astros, big personalities, a lot of fun in the clubhouse. You see, you, you see how they act when they're in the dugout. They have a blast, and they're so much fun to watch and so talented. But the cheating scandal, and there's only four of them still on the team. It's what's a completely it take, different team now. What's, what do you guys think it's going to take for us as a nation 
who has canceled the Astros in our public opinion, what's it going to take for us to forgive them and to let that slide and to move on? Altuve has got to go. Like he's just got to be off the squad. Cause, cause Van and I, we work with the Albuquerque Isotopes. It's the minor league baseball team, a triple A affiliate here for the Colorado Rockies. The only we, team that Ryan never played for. The only team. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and whenever Sugarland comes to town, Sugarland, the triple A affiliate of the Astros, they got exciting players. Like they got cool guys. They got guys that play the game right and go really hard. And unfortunately, the second that these guys get to the next level, which by the way, a lot of them are there now. Van mentioned that there's what'd you say, Van? Four? There's definitely less than five of those guys remaining from the cheating scandals years, or they're automatically associated. Like they can't yeah. escape it. And they should be some of the biggest names in the game because there's so much talent down there, but they're surrounded by guys that didn't for a point respect the game. And, and during that time, they, they stole a championship from the rest of it. Van will tell you everyone was cheating. Everyone was cheating. There just like go. the steroid era of just the Astros were the best at it. So they had to fall on the sword for all of baseball but it was happening in at least half the teams, but the Astros were just the most blatant. Can confirm more teams were trying to do something similar. Yeah. <laughs> can confirm without names or dates or instances. Allegedly. Allegedly. It is my understanding, adjacently to cheating, some people were trying dash some really hard. Ryan LaVarnway. <laughs> Okay, let's let's bring this thing back, boys, before we get too far. <laughs> I'm excited that Bryce Harper is finally on a winning team. Because when he was on the cover of Sports Illustrated at 16 years old, I was like, who's this freaking guy? And he's totally living up to the hype. And if he gets a World Series, I think the cover of Sports Illustrated was totally deserved. You know, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll go right back to the Astros. But... <laughs> All you have to do is be a National League East wildcard team and you just get to automatically beat the Astros in the World Series. Nationals, Braves, and probably this year the Phillies again. So he's on that trajectory. He's on that track. The thing with the Phillies is the way they got in. So the Phillies had to go till the very end. And we talk about this every year. Uh, Ryan, you won a World Series with the Red Sox. Uh, it wasn't so dissimilar of a story to where it's at the end of the year, hey, here's like we're sending all of our guys up and here's a really good push and we're going to get there. And the Phillies going through St. Louis in the wild card, then going through Atlanta in the second round. And that interdivisional stuff to me is just crucial. Anyone can take it. And the Phillies showed that poise and they got superstars. They got guys yeah. that if they were in Philadelphia is a big market. Don't let me act like I'm not talking like it isn't. But if these guys are in L.A. or if these guys are in New York, the magnifying glass is just that much bigger. Bryce Harper and the Phillies right now are my favorite, and that has a lot to do with what San Diego doesn't have currently on their roster. Hey, but good for they for interdivisionally taking on the L.A. Dodgers as well. I know um, it makes it easier because of the new playoff format, but this is the most unlikely of championship series. This is the first time in the history of baseball mm -hmm that two teams with less than 90 wins meet in the championship series. Well, and the Padres to overcome the, the Dodgers who had a 22 game better record than them in the season. It's the biggest upset since 1906 bonkers. That was Crazy a year. couple of years before you two were born. You old man. Oh, ouch. Okay. I'm like ouch. five minutes older than you, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the, the Phillies have superstars. Like you're saying, JT yeah. Riamuto, Reese Hoskins, Gene Segura is under the radar superstar. Sure. Castellano, Schwarber, Har their lineup is ridiculous. How bad does JT Riamuto beat you in a foot race? <laughs> yes. It's like bad, right? He's like, like he's like past second base before I touch first. It he hits that ball the other night that goes off right center or whatever, and yes, and as it's or I guess left center, but then whatever careens into right center, and he by the time he's around second, I'm like this catcher. This son of a gun right here, like he's one of the end. fastest. He's one of the fastest runners in the league for any position, and he plays a position where he doesn't move. So crazy! It's because, and that's like the thing when you're growing up, right? Like Ryan, I'm assuming you played every position. I'm assuming you were the pitcher and the shortstop, and you were all those things. Yeah, but like you put your best, you put your best athlete at catcher. Like that's what you do when you grow up playing baseball. Uh, you don't want the ball to get away. You want to be able to control runners, all those things involved. But then those guys move on to other positions traditionally as they're going into the collegiate and then uh, professional leagues. And to keep those guys there, like Craig Biggio kind of reminded me of that. Where like Craig Biggio was just a stud athlete through and through. 
and you could put him in at catcher. That's just one more athlete on the field as opposed to like uh, one of the heavier Molina brothers. Well, Bryce Harper was a catcher coming through high school and college, remember? Mm -hmm. And then they were like, you, you hit too much. We don't want you to get banged up. Go play outfield. Just stand there. Say, you, maybe three times a game you got to chase one. Yeah, as far as MVPs go, as far as Sports Illustrated all those years ago, as far as uh, that's a clown question, bro. Love this it. this would be like a really good. I almost want to say exclamation point to the end of his sentence because hey, but also maybe forget that maybe ellipses because it's what he does greater than that, right? But if you were to give me Philly over San Diego versus either Houston, the Guardians, or New York, any of that matchup, I would be into. Because you have the effort in the fan base of Philadelphia, which is significant. It's very big. And by the way, Philadelphia fan base right now, the Eagles are undefeated. Like sure. Philadelphia fan base sure. right now is on top of the world. And that energy and enthusiasm will translate to the games played in Philadelphia. Okay, I promise I won't bring up the Astros anymore. Oh, my God. But the Astros like have really embraced being the bad guy. And so has Bryce Harper. And yes. I don't understand. Like – he plays hard. He's fun to watch. He's a great teammate. I don't understand all the Bryce Harper hate. He is what makes baseball great in this current generation of players. It takes it takes a talent to play the heel, right? Mm -hmm. It's a skill. And if you can embrace it, it's a great role that you can play. Similar to, again, when we were at the Super Bowl, you guys interviewed the Miz. Right. right? He's, he's the heel. He's the, the bad boy of the WWE. Bryce Harper can be the bad boy of baseball, and that's a great role if he if he embraces it and the fan base loves him for it, loves to hate him. Well, and, and the thing is, it's fan that doesn't know the game is fan that hates him. Because, like, fan or baseball player, like, even young adult baseball player, like, I broadcast for a university here in New Mexico, New Mexico Highlands University. Every player on New Mexico Highlands University has a Bryce Harper haircut. Like, yes. it's it's he has set the standard for what baseball player needs to look like. And this is going to sound cliche too, to like traditional baseball fan. Bryce Harper has made baseball cool again. And well, between the haircut and the eye black that goes yeah. the war paint down the face. Yeah. Well, and how sexy is it to walk up there, look the part. And you were talking about the Miz, right? Let's use like Ric Flair as an example to walk up, look the part of I'm big, I'm flashy. Uh, I'm better than you. Your girl likes me. My car is nicer than you. This wood bat, I can hit a ball farther than you can with a metal bat. Like, he is that guy that comes in. And then at the end, like at the end of him coming in, he does it. And he's done it his entire career. And whenever the Washington Nationals were like, hey, we actually have a new outfielder who's going to come in and be a little bit better and you can leave, he said, no. He said, I'm actually going to still end up being better. The Miz is – or the Miz – Bryce Harper has never been done wrong in his entire professional career because he don't know how to fail. Excuse me, boys. Uh, in true professional fashion, I had a package delivered that I had to sign for. So my apologies, brothers. <laughs> well, I mean, what's what's in the box? What's in the box? If Harper gets to the stage, what does it change for his persona if he wins it? Like, what does that do to traditional fan base? And I don't mean baseball player. I don't mean fan that gets it i mean old man slow who for a long time has hated bryce harper for no reason i want to see i want to see him not only win the world series i want to see him win the world series mvp and then like we were asking what's it going to take for the astros to be forgiven i think then now he's the superstar he's the hall of famer that everyone's expected him to be since he was 16 years old and, and he's always must see tv that big swing and that big personality so much fun to watch and I think it would legitimize his career and it would take, I mean, because through a different lens of the World Series, he'll probably be seen different because all these people who don't, they have no idea why they hate him. They'll be sitting there watching him like, oh, wow, this guy's really fun. Oh, wow, this guy's really talented. Why have I hated him this whole time? And also you got the example of the Astros, much easier to hate. Also interesting in this, like championship round matchup is what is this 2022 four years ago when Harper and Machado both go to free agency at the exact same time. And there may be two of the youngest in years and most potential and athletes today are not what athletes were 30 years ago. I mean, these guys are set up for success forever. Kind of always poetic the way 
that these storylines find each other, even being at four years yeah. later to where now it's when that conversation was being had, is it Machado or is it Harper? You're going to get to literally watch them battle against each other. And, and you put them all in prime time and it's going to pull a huge ratings number. And, and I'm into this one before the next one. And I'm into the next one much more than I'm into this one. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to handle my energy through, but the first week in November. I mean, and it's a similar story with Machado, right? He's hated for unbeknownst reasons as well. And here they are clashing heads in an unlikely matchup of beating behemoth after behemoth put in their way. 100 win Mets with the best one two punch in baseball. Returning world champion Braves, who are better than they were last year, and they won the friggin' championship. The unbeatable, no one can compete with us except for the Yankees payroll Dodgers. And here they are, an unlikely matchup. And to me, I think this, except for New York, New York, or New York, LA, this leads to better storylines throughout the playoffs. Yeah, I think I think that Bryce Harper and Manny Machado were disliked because of things that they maybe said or did when they were in their early 20s mm -hmm. and were still growing up. I was right. I'm peers with these guys. I played with Manny Machado on the Orioles when he was 21 years old. And I remember looking at him like, you are the best player I've ever played with. You're a you're a guaranteed Hall of Famer, like grow up. And now looking back, like I was also a 20 five-year-old idiot like we all we all say or do things in our early 20s that we later grow up mature and regret and these guys just happen to be superstars on the national stage that we can maybe forgive them for some of the reasons we dislike them because they are growing up to be great human beings they're great teammates i know manny machado is a leader on that san diego team now and he's trying to lead like Fernando Tatis, who's the now the young guy on the national stage with too much money that's still 22 years old or whatever and making mistakes that 22-year-olds make. Uh, Fernando Tatis, as the time of this broadcasting, taking a second wrist surgery today, boys. I don't know if you saw that. I did not. And that's another great storyline. You saw the Braves do it last year without Acuna Jr. And here the Padres have a chance to do it without Tatis Jr., it's just another extra X in the equation that makes this thing more interesting. You're talking, Ryan, about Machado's leadership abilities because I don't know him the way you do. I don't know him interpersonally. Obviously, the Padres went through a little bit of a turmoil with Fernando Tatis, caught 80 games, performance enhancers. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know enough to say confidently what that was. But how do you have to elevate as a leader in the clubhouse whenever you got guys that other players and the front office and the fan base, they were relying on Fernando Tatis Jr. to be a contributor. How do you kind of calm the waters and put your team in the NLCS? Yeah, so you, I haven't I haven't showed you guys what I'm wearing today yet, but I'm wearing the 2020 Marlins playoff sweatshirt. Oh, oh, okay. I mean, that's a pretty fire look. Most so. postseason swag. And what I remember most from that, 20, other than the fact that it was the COVID season, was the first series of the year as the Marlins team, we beat the Phillies, bring it back to the Phillies, and the Phillies TV broadcaster after the game in the post-game show said that if we as the Phillies want to be a real playoff team, we need to beat the bottom feeders like the Marlins. <laughs> and about, <laughs> about six minutes later, we had T-shirts as a team that called us the bottom feeders. Nice. We, we embraced that role. We rallied around the bottom feeders you know, cert name, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And I think when you have something like what happened with the Padres, where you lose your best player, your most famous, most exciting player, as Manny Machado, you rally around that. You say, so what? We're going to do it anyway. And you have that mantra. And not that losing Tatis can ever be a good thing because he's so darn good. But that might have been a rallying cry. That might have been something that they, that they got around and said, you know what? We got to find a way to do this anyway. And then once Tatis is healthy, he better start practicing in center field because you see Kim, the plays that he makes at shortstop, he might be the best glove in all of baseball. Are you going to bump? Are you going to bump your hundreds of million dollar superstar to center field because you got a better glove there? Or do you turn Kim into a utility player next year? Also interesting is that return to the team dynamic, right? Because 
Um, the one I'm very familiar with is the holdout. The holdout doesn't necessarily exist the way it used to in Major League Baseball. Arbitration, obviously, they've kind of eliminated a lot of it. Let's use football as an analogy. A guy will hold out on a contract. A guy will wait. It used to happen before draft picks were slotted. And there would be all this perception from the media. There'd be all this perception from the fan base that, hey, when that guy comes back in, he's going to distract the, the clubhouse or the locker room, and he's going to be a weird new variable or cancer to this thing. What is it when – and this is to you, Ryan, what is it when Fernando Tatis Jr. returns? Is he open? Is he accepted? Do the guys just kind of put all that behind him and he's just reinserted? Or is there like an animosity, especially if they win, Ryan? Is there like an animosity when he returns? Well, what's going to happen is I think that the manager and the leadership are going to have to set the tone for how that goes. Um, and I, I don't know why I'm blanking on his name. And I played with I played for him in, in Oakland, the manager of the Padres right now. Unbelievable, uh, dude. Melvin. Bob Melvin. Yes, I'm thinking. I'm thinking Mel. Bob Melvin is going to handle this, and he's such a people person, and he's such right. a players manager that what he's going to do is he's going to bring Tatis into his office. He's going to say, "Hey, this is how it's going to go. You're going to need to apologize to these boys. You're going to have to man up for what you did. You're going to have to take responsibility for to these guys for what you did." And then Tatis is going to go in. He's going to issue an apology. They're going to have a round table, and they're going to behind closed doors. And then they're going to welcome him back because he's such a good player. He's under contract. He's not going anywhere. It doesn't do any good to hold animosity. So he will be welcomed back. But he, what he's going to need to do is, is own it and apologize to the guys. Yeah, I mean, that's the vibe I get as well. And also the vibe I get is what, what if all of his allegations are true? What if it's actually ringworm medication? I mean, have anyone taken this guy seriously? Is this just a wild story that because players, when they get in trouble, I mean, anybody in general, you sure. hear the wildest stories. Most creative. Like, this is this is just the multi-millionaire athlete version of the dog ate my homework. But what if what if this in one situation it's true? Like he got some some Caribbean ringworm medication and it ruins a year of his life. My last thought, I think, on the Padres before we transition uh, into the next one is they're supposed to be like the big three there, right? It's supposed to be Tatis, Machado, and Soto. And the Padres, who could have had – we'll talk about this a little bit when we talk about this rain delay thing. But the, they could have done like those 90 styles, three guys on the shirt, big heads, like forever, the trio. You could have done um, like a Chevy Chase style uh, – Oh, help me out. Martin, Martin Short, Martin. Three uh, Amigos. Yeah, Three Amigos style. You could have done all these hey, things. I got all your pop culture references today, yeah. brother. You could do all of these things with these guys. But now a little bit, Tatis Jr. is like, he's not in anymore, right? Like he was the original one, but now he's not the one. There's only the two. So does the fan base like bring him back the same way? Because if you're apologizing to the boys and you're apologizing to the clubhouse, I think you also have to apologize to the city. Because San Diego wants to feel like you love them the way that they want to love you. Yeah, you're exactly right about <clears throat> San Diego and their their fan base. Lost their basketball team years ago. Lost their football team recently. It's just the Padres. And the way that town embraces that team and they get that heartbreak of their superstar, not just of the Padres, not just of the National League in the West, he was being primed to be the face of baseball. Mm -hmm. He's yeah. so talented and so exciting, such a huge personality. And he stripped that away from San Diego, not only the team, but the fan base and the city. And like, what gives that city momentum? Obviously, Southern California, right next to Mexico, beautiful weather. But as far as like sports fandom goes, that's it. Yeah, I... <sighs> The thing about it, if it if it really is ringworm, and I like to give the guy the benefit <laughs> of the doubt, is if you got a problem, especially during the season when you're going to the clubhouse every day, you go to the training staff to get the solution to your problem, and the training staff is going to give you something that's not going to make you test positive. Sure. So, not a Caribbean witch doctor. 
No, don't. Yeah, you, yeah, we don't need your Creole medicines here. We just like go, <laughs> like do the thing you're supposed to do. Uh, speaking of problems, Major League Baseball had one last night with the Yankees as they were supposed to host Cleveland in the final game of the ALDS. Uh, the rain came in. This is not unique. Rain happens. Uh, nor'easters are real things. You played in Boston. With that said, fans show up at like five o'clock. There's not an announcement till like six thirty. The game's not going to go on. These are all East Coast times. And then they don't notify anyone for about three hours that this thing is canceled. It's happening tomorrow. By the way, non-refundable, non-exchangeable. Got to use it tomorrow, fan of baseball. Uh, so so go find your deals right now if you're in the East Coast for that game tonight for uh, individuals who are going to make it. They're going to play at 4 o'clock Eastern. I get the idea, boys. I get the idea of going to the airport, and they know your flight is two hours delayed, but they tell you every 15 minutes. Feels a little bit to me like the fan was lost here. Ryan, you've been in these clubhouses during these situations. And by the way, I've been at Yankee Stadium during a rain delay. You can drink beers. It's fine. But they're communicating with you, right? They haven't. You have an understanding of what's going on. Why is there such a lapse, Ryan, in your opinion, on why the fan base of these two teams and those in attendance at Yankee Stadium weren't kept in the loop? Well, I think sometimes when the weather forecast is changing or unpredictable, they really don't know what's going to happen. Right. Sometimes there's pop-up showers. This year I played in Jacksonville which had the, the highest temperature in the country, the highest humidity. It, it rained almost every single day. Sometimes you just don't know. And you'll see as the fans, as the players, you'll see the umpires and the managers walking around the field. Is this thing playable? How, how long would it take to get turfists on this thing and dry it out? Is the warning track a, a health issue? Mm -hmm. you, don't want, you don't want some of these superstar players going for a ball near the fence and slipping and, and injuring themselves. So I don't think that anybody is trying to keep the fans out of the loop. Sometimes you just don't know. What's a better a plan for this game? Is it sitting there and waiting out the original storm or rolling the dice on the next day? Because just because it rains one day doesn't mean you're not going to get rain the next day. It can rain just as hard today, and they're in the same predicament. That's true. They're, they're taking tomorrow's weather forecast into into mm -hmm. consideration when they're making these decisions because if it was going to rain all day today in new york they would have waited until one in the morning and played that game well obviously like how garbage monday night football was i was hoping <laughs> so bad that i could get some good playoff baseball after that game this is i talk about this new york's like i think the number one at it but any time that there's like a situation that's like baseball adjacent, so like a rain delay in the ALDS that's going to push the game back, you used to for years have all these like um, street vendors that would go and print up like T-shirts, like I survived the rain delay, or it'd be all these things. And that stuff doesn't exist anymore. And that's I, that's all like a fanatics thing. We could talk about that at length too, because Major League Baseball branding is important to me. But like, give me weird bootleg stuff too. And whenever they're making this announcement, that's what I was like. You're, I was like, oh, someone's going to capitalize on this. Mm -hmm. Someone's going to make all the money on this. There's going to be a a rain delay, a rain delay Twitter that just like all of a sudden erupts because Major League Baseball is not is refusing to talk to the fan base. And by refusing, I recognize Ryan saying, hey, maybe they don't know. But because they're not talking, there's like a dollar to be made here. Like, where is where is that really creative individual that has the quote unquote real? rain delay update because major league baseball fan will subscribe to that in droves especially if they live in jacksonville <laughs> well the only thing that i can relate to with this is when there's been a few times where they'll say hey we want to sell beer for another hour you guys can sneak out the back door oh that's Just so funny don't yeah. tweet anything out that the game's canceled because beer sales are high during rain delays the, i did love you that so much did you see where the Cleveland was uh, like throwing footballs in the stands with with like Yankee fan, and then security came out and they were like, "Do, do not throw footballs in the stands with Yankee fan, Cleveland. <laughs> like, like do not allow baseball to be fun. We're Major League Baseball. You stop it. Yeah, and, and don't fault. don't forget that just a couple months ago, Yankees fan tried to fight Miles Straw. Oh like, yeah, this that's is who was throwing. That's who was playing catch. Yeah, it's bonkers. The quick turnaround, right? How quick do you guys lead the boo session of the security guy when he comes out and like, like literally like Darrell Revis, like intercepts the pass. And he's like, he's like, no, not in my, not in my Yankees house. So funny. <laughs> and also like, say you're the security guy, you're a security guy at, at the Yankee stadium, which is what? Like, that's like an off duty cop or something, right? That's sure. like, 
And, and we're, we're not talking – oh, there we go. We're not talking New York Yankee uh, – or, excuse me, security guy uh, like here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, who just hangs out at the game. We're talking like super hard New York like police officer, and they're doing like Rochambeau in the back to like see who has to go out there and take the football away. Like th- I don't need this. I, that's not what I signed up for. I signed up to to tell people to stop yelling at, at anyone named Ramirez. <laughs> Hey, Frankie, it's your turn. Get out there. Go get the ball. Hey, what are we doing? We the phone police? You got the ball last time. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoot, boys. Oh. Dude, hey, this rain delay, I promise, this is the last time I'll talk about the Astros. So this <laughs> rain delay either plays perfectly into their hands or this is detrimental to the Astros because, you know, the, uh, the rust or rest argument, right? Whoever no. wins this game... It's a game five. Your playoff life is at is at stake. You're going to win. You're going to celebrate. You're going to have all that energy and take it to the very next day and go play baseball while the Astros are sitting back here getting massages, getting treatment. They're just chilling and hanging out. He's cutting like, their toenails. For this them. is like the perfect like rest versus rust argument, and we're seeing it unfold right now. What is this going to be? And pr- like – this plays way more into the Yankees hands because the Yankees are just going to hop into the nicest private jet that baseball has. And then the Cleveland baseball team is going to have to fly coach on Southwest. All middle seats. (laughs) All in a a row. Hey, you've played in these do or die like elimination games, the chaos before this, who does it benefit Ryan? Like who, what does all this do either for Yankee or for guardian? Like, like what is the advantage here? Yeah. So I had spring training with the Yankees. I obviously was in the world series with the Red Sox and the media attention that you get on a daily basis is about 10 times more than what the guardians have from when I, when I was with Cleveland last year in Cleveland, you have maybe four, four to five beat reporters, maybe one TV camera in the locker mm-hmm. room post game. Uh, Now, after the COVID situation, the media situation in the locker room is a little bit different. If they want to interview you, they pull you into the room in front of the screen. You do the you do the interviews on camera. But before COVID and during playoffs, there is a media circus, especially in New York, especially in Boston. You have media members, cameras lining the field before these games from foul pole to foul pole on the warning track all along the way. There's hundreds of them. If you're talking about who does it benefit, the Yankees are much more used to this kind of attention, this sure. kind of criticism, this kind of being under a microscope. You talk about Garrett Cole, who people make fun of for being Kermit the Frog, but he's been doing these interviews every day. They they criticize whether he has a limp, whether he put his shoes on the wrong way, whether he tied his shoes the right way. The Guardians kind of fly under the radar, play with a little bit less pressure all year. Well, so that's the stuff that relates directly to media, but what about like, Hey, you're Cleveland and you have your family in town. Your family's in New York for the game. They're, do, hey, do their tickets work the next day? Do they got to extend a hotel? All that kind of stuff that exists outside the game. Is that handled by the players on the field? Or is there someone in the organization or is there like an allotted family member? Did you have that that kind of handles all that distraction stuff whenever your focus has to be on going to the championship series? Yeah, each team has a travel secretary that's kind of in charge of booking the hotels. Hey, my family needs an extra room here. That's going to fall on, on that travel secretary. And I know the Guardians have two guys that do it that are that are really good at what they do. But like you're saying, yeah, the Yankees have their apartments that they're in. They're not worried about moving out. They don't have a place to go sleep that night. The Guardians are in the hotel. It is going to be a little bit more difficult for the Guardians. Last thought on the uh, division round and then into the championship round. Phillies and Padres. Boys, we're going to do the show once a week until we find a heavier schedule. Uh, By the time we sit down next week, the Padres and the Phillies will have played three games. Uh, Where do we believe that this series will stand by the next time we connect? I'll jump out and say Phillies 2-1 at this point. I think the top of the Phillies rotation – is superior to the top of the Padres rotation. Padres has uh, a better bullpen, has more starting depth, but the one-two punch at the uh, the Phillies have with 
with uh, Nola and Wheeler. I think that's superior, and that's going to get them out to an early lead. Yeah, I'm going to say 2-1 Phillies also. I think their lineup is just tough to pitch to. You know, Musgrove and Snell at the top of the Padres uh, pitching rotation are really tough, but this Phillies lineup is just unbelievable. I can't believe they got all these guys in one lineup, and we don't talk about them more. I don't know if Philadelphia will lose a game. I, I yeah, I watched them against obviously the St. Louis Cardinals in the divisional round, and there at the end of the season, as as they were revving up to kind of make that push to that Milwaukee situation was weird. Speaking of Hater now with the Padres, to me, led by the athletes on the field, Bryce Harper specifically. Oh gosh, boys, they they might be in a really good spot come come World Series time because I, I don't think the Padres are on the same level. Well, the Phillies need to get early leads. That's for sure. Because I don't see them making a lot of late inning comebacks right. against that Padres bullpen. Suarez hasn't given up a run since May. That's crazy. And Josh Hader is Josh Hader. Like you saw him strike out the side to close out the last series. When he's on, he is absolutely unhittable. So for the Phillies to be successful, need good starting pitching and need to get some early leads. Because if they if they're down late, it's Padres. Give me your prediction, boys, for the ALDS. How does this one wrap up tonight? Yankees and Guardians. I got the sneaky boys. I got the Guardians stringing singles together, smart base running, stealing bases, clutch bullpen. Give me the Cleveland baseball team going forward to play my beloved Houston baseball Astros. Ooh-wee. Yeah, I think my I think the 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 smart bet in Vegas is probably going to have the odds on the Yankees, but I'm going to go with the Guardians too. I think they've got the heart. I think they've got the uh, camaraderie, and I think they've got the better manager. Mm. Like all that, I love Cinderella stories. You actually love Cinderella. You don't shut up about it. I regularly I talk about. It. I'm a glass <laughs> slipper guy. <sighs> You're at the closeout game. You got pitchers that haven't gone yet, really. Get, oh. Yankees at home because of the rain, though. Like it's, I think that's the biggest factor. And I and I think because traditionally Yankee has been there before this team, not necessarily as much. But I I think the culture of it's going to allow the Yankees to to pull this one out in the end. And you're going to end up um, with that Yankees Astros ALCS. And then again, we'll we'll be halfway through that one by the time we're back. Um, so you boys got Cleveland. I got New York. I think if Cleveland makes it through, Cleveland has the advantage over Houston. And I think if New York makes it through, Houston has the advantage over New York. Where do you boys stand in the ALCS? Uh, well, you know my obvious answer. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's the Astros. It's the Astros is going to sweep their way. Going to be a perfect 11-0 in the playoffs this year, they're going to cement Sweet. themselves as one of the best all around teams in the history of baseball. The Yankees aren't what they were at the beginning of the year. The Cleveland baseball team doesn't have the talent to keep up with Houston, whatever matchup it's all Astros. My eyes are hurting from rolling in the back of my head. So <laughs> fast when you said that. I, I, I'm taking either the, the Guardians or the Yankees, whoever wins, over the Astros, just to rub an advanced face. Thank you very much. There yes. you go, boys. Putting a cap on it. Uh, tune in regularly with us. We're going to we're gonna change the format up a little bit. Um, like I said, episode zero was more of a proof of concept. We make sure everything works sure. right. We make sure uh, everyone looked good. And obviously, uh, Van, you're standing a distant three and looking good. So uh, three hole hitter is an important hitter. So you should appreciate Usually that. the bronze is a point of pride. No, but there's only the three of us. Uh, throughout the course of this program, uh, obviously we're gonna we're gonna talk all sports. Baseball is not year round. We're also gonna talk pop culture, current events, news of the day. Ryan has a lot of connections throughout the world of baseball, so we're bringing out a lot of friends of Ryan. And we're gonna hit on, we're gonna hit topics with them. A little inside baseball, literally. Anything sure. before I cut this thing loose, boys? No, I had a lot of fun with it, boys. I'm really excited going forward, and let's uh, LFG. Okay, that's so dumb. Yeah, we talk about bronze, man. Don't be afraid to mix in a little bronzer with that light you got shining on you, pal. I like that. That's a very yeah. good one. That's a a very super good one. Zinger. <laughs> Ryan, thank you for not cussing. Of course. Professional.
keeping it clean. Good job, everyone. GG. See you next time, baby. Peace.